Good evening, good night, good morning, and good afternoon. Welcome everyone who is joining us from different parts of the country and from around the world. We are happy to have you attend this webinar for the first lectures of our Parenting with Purpose series organized by Texas Family Enrichment. As our name says it, we organize family enrichment courses every year, but due to the pandemic, we had to cancel them and present these lectures instead. This in no way replaces our courses, but supplements them. As many of you know, family enrichment courses use the case study method, which it has been proven to be one of the best methods for adults to learn. So we encourage you to sign up for a family enrichment course in the future in the city or country where you live. That being said, the lectures in the midst of a pandemic are a great way to continue our formation and as parents. And in this case of today's talk, solving conflict in marriage, it's a great way to improve our marriage, which is the basis of our, you know, of our family, the foundation of our families. Starting the series, we have Mr. Doug Hinderer. Uh, Doug, you can um, stop the, you can start your video. And so that we can see you, good. Here's Doug. Okay, welcome Doug, thank you for joining us. Uh, so uh, he is from Chicago, Illinois, and um, a little background about him. Uh, in July, 2017, Doug received an, an MA in marriage and family therapy and currently works part-time as a marriage therapist at the Chicago Christian Counseling Center. He also has a private practice in which he provides teletherapy throughout Illinois. In addition to seeing couples and individuals experiencing marital disharmony, he conducts day-long workshops for married couples and engaged couples. You can learn more about Doug and his private practice by visiting his website, happymarriageforlife.com. Prior to his career in marriage counseling, Doug worked for 36 years in human resources, retiring in 2016 as a senior vice president, human resources and association leadership development at the National Association of Realtors. Doug and his wife, Shirley, have been married for 40 years and have nine children and five grandchildren. After this lecture, Doug will answer two or three questions from the audience. You can submit them via the Q&A or the, or the chat. I already see we have some, some people that are in the chat already. Um, anyway, um, I also wanted to mention that Texas Family Enrichment is a non-for-profit organization. So if you wanna uh, leave a small donation, no, no obligation, you can do so in our website. Uh, so with per any further ado, we will, um, we uh, will um, join, uh, I mean, sorry, I got distracted. Some of the, the chat said that there was an internet issue. So, I mean, I don't know what, what's going on. So let, let me see, but without further ado, I, I will, we will start the talk, but hold on a minute. Ch uh, lots of background noise. Uh, okay, well, some people uh, are experiencing a, a background noise. There's no noise here, but anyway, I'm sorry. Um, so, okay, um, Doug, if you want to go ahead and start, um, we'll, we'll be um, with you listening for about 45 minutes and then uh, Q&A, all right? Sounds good. Thank you, Pilar. It's good to be here, everybody. Thank you. I, you know, uh, I do a lot of teletherapy these days, and it's it's not bad, but it still has its its bugs. And um, a bad internet connection will mess everything up, and it brings in a lot of noise and interference and things. So um, there's no, uh, no no replacing a good internet connection. Anyway, it's great to be here uh, with you. And I, you know, this is my second career, and I've got a real passion for helping couples, uh, engaged couples, make a good choice to begin with and get off to a good start in the marriage. And then married couples to smooth out the rough edges, which is why I, I do these workshops and I see couples uh, individually as well. So, uh, and I like to think in terms of headlines and there's the two headlines that we'll start off, <clears throat> excuse me, tonight with is conflict cannot um, be eliminated. So it must be managed. Uh, and it's not conflict that destroys marriages, 
it's conflict avoidance. And I put together some a PowerPoint. Oh, you probably can't see that. I'm going to do it all wrong. So let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, uh, Pilar, that says you've disabled my screen sharing. So maybe you can enable me to share my screen. See how that goes. Anyway, so, but that's the deal, right? So listen, of all the problems in marriages, 70% of problems are perpetual and they're just gonna stay with you during the, the entire length of marriage. But 30% of conflict in marriages can be solved, all right? The good news is you don't have to solve all the problems of your marriage to be happily married. You solve the ones you can and, and we accept and, and we learn to adjust with the things that we can, okay? We learn to smile and use humor. I mean, the bottom line is, listen, you married a person with defects. That's it. I mean, we've got original sin and along the road to adulthood, we pick up a few other de defects. You know, we become prideful and, and uh, you know, you look at the seven deadly sins, right? We just become selfish and we develop a temper and an anger and be, you know, so we all have defects. Those defects are going to get in the way. That's just the nature of the beast. All right. One of the top uh, marriage counselors, therapists in the country is a guy named Dan Weil. And I, I, I like reading this quote from him. It's a little lengthy, but I think it really uh, gets the point. It says, when choosing a partner, you are inevitably choosing a particular set of unsolvable problems that you will be living with forever. Marriages are successful to the degree that the problems you choose are ones you can live with. Really good advice for people who aren't yet married, but once you're married, you're already stuck with those problems. Paul married Alice, and Alice gets loud at parties, and Paul, who is shy, hates that. But if Paul married Susan, he and Susan would have gotten into a fight before they even got to the party. That's because Paul's always late, and Susan hates to be kept waiting. She would feel taken for granted, which she's very sensitive about. Paul would see her complaining about this as her attempt to dominate him, which he's very sensitive about. If Paul married Gail, they wouldn't even have gone to the party because they would still be upset about an argument they had the day before about Paul's not helping with the housework. To Gail, when Paul doesn't help, she feels abandoned, which she's sensitive about. And to Paul, Gail's complaints tend to dominate him, which he's sensitive about. Same would be true about Alice if she'd have married Steve. So he goes on with the same kind of scenario if she'd have married different people. So no matter who you would uh, marry, that person has defects. And, you know, so much for the, for the idea that, uh, boy, if we're not getting along real well, or we're not perfectly compatible, or we're not soulmates, I must have made a mistake. I need to find somebody new. No matter who you marry, you're going to find a person with defects. You know, and we know that the divorce rate for first marriage is about 50%. The divorce rate for second marriages, 66%. For third marriages, 75%. So practice doesn't make it better. It makes it worse, right? So we need to learn to get along with the spouse that we have. Excuse One me, look at this. Yes. You want to try and share the screen? All right. And there's some people, is it able, uh, enabled for you? No, it still says disabled, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Mm, I, I fixed it, but anyway, it, there's some people that say that they cannot hear you very well. So I'm not sure if you can do something about that, but I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, I don't know that I've got, I, I don't have a okay, better the, um, the, the This is being recorded, so it can be, you know, they can listen in. Yeah. Okay. I'll try not to, uh, I'll try to enunciate better if that's possible. So sorry about that. All right, so, but if we look at this thing, I think from a uh, spiritual perspective, um, we are often perfected through our spouse's imperfections. So think about that for a minute, right? I think God often gives us a spouse that will help us grow in the virtue we most need to acquire or overcome a defect that we have. So for instance, if we tend to be impatient, God may give us a spouse who tends to be late from time to time to help us grow in that virtue, right? Or if we tend to be stingy with our money, perhaps we'll marry somebody who's very liberal and with their money and donates to every charity that calls on the phone, right? So if we look at it from a supernatural perspective, the defects of our spouse actually are good things because it helps us grow in virtue. And what we know is virtuous people tend to be happy people. So in, in a very direct way, our spouse's defects actually can help us sanctify our life and get to heaven even better. All right. And so the basic strategy is to be able to accept our partner's personalities because we're not going to change it. 
which means we need patience and tolerance, all right? Another way to look at it, I just uh, came across something on the internet and I, I don't have the citation for it, but it really hit me as a very powerful message. And the author was writing in Persona Christi as though he was Christ talking to a husband. And what he said to the husband was, my son, I suffered my passion and my death on the cross to redeem your wife. And if she'd have been the only human being on the face of the earth, I would have gladly suffered all that I suffered and died on the cross for her. She's that important. There may be times though when I will ask you to join me in suffering for your wife's salvation. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to unite your suffering with mine to bring about her sanctification? I think, and it goes the other way, of course, for wives to husbands. But I think that's a powerful message, right? That somehow we're intertwined in this and the conflict that God allows in our lives because of original sin, because of our own defects, because of the effect of Satan, you know, whispering in our ears, somehow it can very definitively work for the sanctification of our spouses and for ourselves as well, all right? All right, so, Pilar, do I... Oh, oh, I think I can share now. Good, here we go. I got it, okay. I think people can probably see that, which is great. Let me go here. There we go, all right. So, all right, so this is the introductory. Th oh, this is my last slide. Let's go back to the first one. So, man conflict management and marriage. Conflicts cannot be eliminated, so it must be managed. It's not conflict that damages marriages, it's conflict avoidance. But we tend to avoid conflict because we, we're afraid of a fight. You know, we're afraid that um, uh, it's going to end up an argument. We don't want to do that. So we just kind of take it because no one has taught us how to handle conflict to manage it well. Well, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. All right. So this is by far and away my worst slide. It's the ugliest one, but it's also the most important one. This slide gives you a graphic way of how to look at relationships and the interaction between husbands and wives. So on the uh, left side, we've got the husband with the H. On the right side, we've got the wife. On the top of the infinity loop, the B stands for behaviors, and the bottom, the E stands for emotions. And it's an infinity loop. So there are, you know, there's no off ramps on an infinity loop. Behaviors elicit emotions, emotions drive behaviors, which then elicit emotions, which then drive behavior. So by way of example, let's say the husband stops off one night on his way home, picks up some flowers. That's the behavior. That's gonna elicit a positive emotion, hopefully, although not always, but normally that's gonna elicit a positive emotion on the part of the wife. When the wife is, is happy and the husband's done something nice for her, that's going to drive a positive behavior. So she's more likely to give him a, a, a longer hug and a nicer kiss and smile at him and thank him and tell him he's a nice guy. Well, when the wife is giving the husband a longer kiss and a longer hug and smiling at him, that's going to elicit positive emotions on his part. So then he's more likely to do some positive things like watch the kids or you know help with dishes afterward or tell her how beautiful she is which then makes her feel better, and now she's doing it. So now we're off to having a really good evening because we're doing things as a husband and wife that are eliciting positive emotions in each other. And that's how then the affinity loop keeps going. On the converse side, let's say the, the husband comes home an hour late and doesn't call. Then when he walks in the door, the wife will most likely be upset. So then that's going to drive a behavior, right? So she may, let's say she gives him the silent treatment. So he walks in the door, he goes to give her a kiss. She turns and just lets him kiss her on the cheek because she's upset. Well, now the husband, when he's looking for a good kiss and he gets to kiss her cheek, now he's going to have a negative emotion. He's going to be a little upset, which is then going to drive a behavior. Men being what they are, trying to fix problems and being a little bit thick-headed sometimes, he might say, well, what's wrong with you? At which point that question is going to elicit an even more negative emotion on the part of the wife, at which point she may say, well, if I have to tell you, well, I'm not going to do it. You ought to be smart enough to figure it out yourself. Now the husband's feeling insulted, so now he's angry, so now we're off and we're going to have a bad night, okay? So behaviors drive emotions emotions drive behaviors. The place between the emotion and the behavior 
is what I call the devil's playground. Because once a negative emotion gets elicited, now we start thinking, hey, has he ever done anything like that before? Well, yes, he has. There was He was late a year ago. And I remember 40 years ago when we were dating, he, he showed up late one time. And I and then he forgot, you know, my birthday. And then sweetest day. And all of a sudden, the devil starts bringing up all these memories of the past times when he was forgetful or not considerate. And it builds and it builds and it builds. And then we get to get this kitchen sink kind of thing. Okay. So the, 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 the infinity loop is really powerful. And when I'm working with couples, we spend a lot of time talking about what they're doing that's eliciting negative emotions. Now, this is a closed system. So if we change any one of the four, we change the system. So in the case of the husband coming home late, if he, if he uh, doesn't come home late, we don't have a problem. But if he comes home late, the wife can choose rather than to be upset about it, to be grateful that he's home and he's not dead somewhere, that he didn't have a car accident or whatever. So she could choose to be happy about it. Or if she's angry about it, she can choose not to say that she's angry or not to do something angrily but tell him calmly that she's a little upset. Or if she actually does something angry, like yell at the husband, the husband, rather than have a negative emotion, could say, you know what? I deserve it because I was late and I was a knucklehead and I should have called and I didn't. So he doesn't necessarily have to have negative emotion. And even if he has a negative emotion, he can choose to say something kind and try to patch up the damage rather than be angry in return, okay? So it's a really good way of looking at how relationships work in, in communication. This works, it's pretty powerful with children as well, and it can it, it works in the workplace as well. All right, so that gives you a diagram for how relationships work. Now I wanna talk about um, needs and fears, okay? Men and women have a primary need and a primary fear. So the primary need for a man is respect and for a woman is love. Now this comes, this is scriptural, this comes right from I think Paul's letter to the Ephesians where he says uh, husbands love your wives and wives respect your husband. So here we are 2,000 years later and we've got a lot of scientific evidence out there that studied relationships and here's the conclusion that science has reached as well. Now this doesn't mean that, uh, that men don't need love and that women don't need to be respected. But what it does mean is, generally speaking, of course, there's exceptions to all of this because we're human and we're so diverse. But generally speaking, a woman will be more uh, um, uh, alert or sensitive to anything she perceives to be unloving, and a man will be more sensitive to anything he perceives to be disrespectful. And if 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 a woman's not feeling loved, a man's not feeling respected, that's going to lead to negative emotional responses, anger or sadness, primarily. All right, and the fears. Men fear failure more than anything, and women feel a fear abandonment. They fear being alone, being pushed aside, being told she's not important, okay? Being ignored triggers a lot of negative emotions in women generally. Now, men can certainly feel abandoned or pushed aside or, or, or they're not important, and women can certainly be made to feel like failures, but we're more sensitive to failure and to abandonment. You know, men, I mean, you know, we're, we're raised to be generally very competitive, uh, you know, athletically, on the sports fields growing up, uh, academically, you know, in school. Uh, it, you know, just look at, just look at, you know, two men that pull up alongside each other at a red light, and they're looking at each other like, okay, who's going to get through the intersection first? This competitive thing, right? And so they're like, who's going to get through first? They're looking, glancing back before the light turns it off to go. And they're driving minivans. You know, they're drag racing minivans through an intersection, but they're guys, and that's what guys do, okay? So um, the important thing to realize is when a negative emotion gets triggered in you, one of these four e emotions, needs or fears, is getting triggered. And at the core of a lot of this, these are the four things that go on. So if you look at my example about the husband who came home late and did not call, most likely that triggered in his wife feeling of abandonment or feeling of not being important. Because if I was important, you would have called and you didn't. So you must not think I'm too important. 
So that triggered this feeling of abandonment or being pushed aside or not being important. So then when she points that out and says, why wouldn't you call? That wasn't too considerate. What that triggers in the husband is, I failed. Now I'm a failure as a husband and I'm uncomfortable being a failure. So now I got to defend myself because I don't really think I'm a failure. I got to defend the fellow's traffic. And I, you know, da, 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 da. depending on the wife's tone of voice, he might also feel disrespected or some of the language he chooses to use, at which point he pushes back and then she's not feeling loved either. All right. So needs and fears, very powerful motivators, uh, but it works the opposite way too. So if, if the husbands are treated with respect, and they get praised and their successes are acknowledged, that's going to put them in a really good state of mind, a really good emotional place. And when women feel loved and cared for by their husbands and feel that they are an important part of their husband's life and they are, they are, uh, 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 their input is encouraged and, and, and desired by their husbands, that's going to put them in a very good emotional state as well. So, one of the predictors or one of the characteristics of happily married couples is when they accept influence from each other. So when they both feel they have an opportunity to give input to their spouse and that that input is listened to and acknowledged, okay? So, uh, and then, so you're not feeling abandoned, then you don't feel like a failure if in fact you're brought into the conversation, all right? So that's needs and fears. There are, the next thing I want to talk about are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And this was uh, come out of the research of John Gottman, who's probably the leading researcher in marriage um, in the country for the past 40 years. He's got some unbelievably long longitudinal studies he's done, and, and he just has taken a real scientific approach to the study of marriage. Uh, and he discovered the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And these are four things that, uh, if present, are predictive of marital disharmony, and if present at a high enough level, are very predictive of divorce. So it's important to know what these four horsemen are so that you can avoid them, all right? And here they are, it's criticism, defensiveness, contempt, and stonewalling. Now, I know what criticism is. Criticism is what I'm telling you what's wrong with you because obviously you can't figure it out. So by me pointing out what's wrong with you, you'll change and then I'll be happy, right? So it's not so much you're defective, but there's something you're doing that's annoying me. So I'm gonna criticize you about, it. okay? But the problem with criticism is it's gonna trigger one of the needs or fears. Defensiveness. So defensiveness is, you know what? It's not my fault, it's your fault. I, you know what? I, I got drunk last night because you were nagging me. Quit nagging me and I'll quit drinking so much, right? So it's not my fault, it's your fault. Obviously, if I don't own my share of the problem or of the conflict, we can't get it resolved because I, you know, I've got a share. Now, maybe I only have a 10% share. Maybe I got 50, maybe I got 80, but I, whatever it is, I've got to share it. I've got to own it. And if I'm defensive, I'm not owning any responsibility. Uh, number three is contempt. And contempt is mean-spirited criticism. So contempt uh, is characterized by sarcasm, cynicism, mockery, you know, name calling. Um, the intent of contempt is to actually hurt the other person verbally. It's like getting a punch in the ribs. Um, and, it's, it, and it is the most predictive of divorce when contempt shows up because it, it's intentionally hurtful. Defensiveness, I'm trying to protect myself. Criticism, I'm trying to help you. Contempt, I'm trying to hurt you. And then the fourth one is stonewalling. And stonewalling is when I just shut down. I just tune you out. I walk away. I escape, okay? You know, it's an attempt for me to reduce the pain of the argument, but it leads to emotional disengagement, right? It, it, uh, and, and stonewalling is one of the hardest problems to fix because I've just shut down emotionally and I've kind of died emotionally. And so stonewalling, there's, there's a good component to stonewalling in that some of Gottman's research has shown that physiologically, once your heart rate gets above about 90 beats per minute, you've lost your ability to be rational. And so once you escalate, you're just going to do harm. And some people are just kind of intuitive, that, especially men. Men tend to stonewall much more than women, but men escalate physiologically much more quickly than women. 
And so intuitively, we kind of know when we're into this fight or flight thing, and I don't want to fight you. So I'm just going to, I'm fly, I'm going to flight. I'm going to get out of there. I'm going to fly away. I'm going to stonewall. So there's a positive side to stonewalling in that the, the, the argument is not going to continue when it's just going to do harm and no good. But again, especially if it's the husband stonewalls, and that's about 70% of the cases, it's the husband that shuts down, avoids the problem. That leaves the wife feeling abandoned, a feeling like she's not important. And so she'll pursue trying to get reconnected with the husband, and he keeps withdrawing because it's too painful. The conflict is too painful. So that's called pursue withdraw, where the wife pursues and the husband withdraws. That's about 70% of the couples. Now, the solution to that is when you need to call the time out, you also announce when you will come back. All right. I'm too upset now to talk about this. I need an hour. I need to go for a walk. I need to calm down. Or I'm too upset. I, I, I can't deal with this tonight. We're going to have to pick it back up tomorrow. It is okay to, to put off solving the problem till the next day. Because, you know, the, the adage about don't go to bed when you're angry, in some cases, that would mean you're not going to sleep all night long. And we still got a life to live the next day. We've got a job to go to, whatever. So um, it's okay to say, listen, I love you. I'm angry now. I'm really hurt by what you did. I still love you, but I can't deal with this now. So let's just go to bed and we'll pick it up in the morning. All right. And you've got the antidotes there on the, on the uh, right. General starter, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Defensiveness, take responsibility, talk about that. Contempt, you got to talk about your own feelings and needs. That's part of what general startup is that we're going to get to here in just a second. Stonewalling is, you know, learn how to breathe, learn how to calm down or just announce when you're gonna come back after, uh, uh, after you need your break, okay? So those are the four horsemen. Now, when I work with couples individually, we spend time looking at behaviors that trigger emotions, how that works. And then in the middle of conflict, we look at which one of these horses show up and identify that. And then the couple, you know, they need to make an agreement with each other that we are not going to climb on any of those four horses. And when they show up or we fall into that habit, which we've had now we've over the course of years, we're going to, we're going to call it out and we're going to walk away. So, so if the husband starts with some criticism of the wife, the wife has the, the, the granted authority they've given each other to say, hey, wait a minute, that's criticism. At which point the husband has to say, you know what, you're right. Let me find a different way to say it. Or if the husband's getting defensive, the wife has the right to call him out and say, wait, you're getting defensive. Husband that needs to acknowledge, accept that. It's okay, let me find a different way to say it. All right. So we got to, we just got to know that these are the four things that destroy marriages. And if you can control these four and not fall into these traps, you've got a really good shot at being happily married and handling conflicts as they go. All right. So, but the solution is, is a communication strategy that we're going to talk about now. And this, it, it seems, overly simple. And some people look at it and, and have said, Doug, I don't, this can't really work. It just doesn't, you know, it's conflict is too big a deal. And we got too hard of feelings to actually, it's got to be something more complicated to, to fix our conflict. And really, it's not, it's a really simple thing. And it's called gentle startup. And here's how it goes. It's very simple. It's three sentences. You start off with the words, I feel, and then you label your emotion. When you, and then you talk about the behavior. So this actually works the reverse of the infinity loop, which behaviors drive emotions. We start off with the emotion, then go back to the behavior that caused me to feel that way. And then we finish by saying, and I'd like to ask you to please. And then we'll, however you want things to be different next time. This is probably the second most important slide I've got. Maybe the first, maybe more so than how a relationship works. If you can embrace this, it, you will resolve 90% of your conflicts in under two minutes and without hard feelings. It just works that well. So for instance, let's, let's take an example. So let's take the example of when the husband came home late and didn't call, all right? We resolve it by the wife saying, listen, I feel unimportant to you when you come home an hour late and don't call. 
And I'd like to ask you to please call if you're going to be more than 15 minutes late. That's a much better way to solve the problem than to, than to get into name calling or to stonewall or to give them the cold shoulder or to call him names or to criticize him for always being late, for never being considered, for never thinking about me, et cetera, right? So I feel when you, and I'd like to ask you to please, so I feel that you've got to be good at labeling your emotion. And some people really struggle with that. Uh, and I've got a, an emotion wheel that I give to some clients that help them identify their emotions. But it's got to be an emotion. You can't say, I feel like you're being a jerk. That may be true, but that's not an emotion. Okay, that's a label. That's a criticism, maybe a contempt. So I feel, and there you label your emotion. And I, I'll, give you a, I'll give you a personal example of how this works. So uh, a few months ago, I'm up here in my office. I'm working away on my computer, 10 o'clock in the morning. And my wife brings me uh, uh, a freshly brewed cup of hot tea. And I love hot tea. To which I say to her, thank you. To which she says, you're welcome. And she leaves. Perfect. She comes back 10 minutes later. Now, the way my wife does this, she says, I'd like to have a gentle conversation with you. At which point, well, I can't give a direct quote, but I, I thought something like, oh, shoot, what what could I have done wrong? I've been up here all morning. I, so I was taken aback by it. So she said to me, listen, I felt uh, uh, a little taken for granted when I brought you the cup of tea and you thanked me, but you did not look up from your computer screen. And I'd like to ask you to look at me next time. Wow. I mean, that was, you know what? And I, guilty as charged. And my wife's really pretty. I like looking at her. So that's not a hard request to comply with. But so I stood up, I gave her a hug and I, and I thanked her for being gentle on how she told me that I had hurt her feelings. Because 99% of the time when we hurt each other, it's not intentional. You know, we don't wake, I didn't wake up that morning thinking, oh, how can I insult my wife? Oh, I know. I'll wait till she does something nice and I'll ignore her. I won't look at her. So, you know, but so if we go back, let me go back a couple slides to, to the infinity loop. In the old days, so let's look at this, right? So I did not look at her when she brought, when I thanked her for the tea, which elicited a negative emotion on her part. Now, the behavior was she came upstairs and we did the general start, and we got the thing resolved right away. But in the old days, what often happens is the, between the emotion where her feelings were hurt and the behavior, since she didn't, since we don't know how to handle conflict oftentimes, that's the devil's playground in there. So she'd have gone back downstairs. She'd have been thinking about it. Man, that kind of was kind of rude on his part. And boy, has he ever been rude before? Well, yeah, he was. There was this time and, you know, a year ago. And I remember, boy, I remember at, uh, you know, at, uh, at my birthday party five years ago, you, you know, and, and all of a sudden, the devil starts popping all these memories into her, her, into her mind, right? So she'd have, you know, noodled on that for a while. I'd have gone down at noon to have some lunch with her. And she'd have been a little bit off, you know, a little terse, maybe. And I'd have said to something like, hey, is everything okay? And she'd have said, yeah. And I said, I'd have said, are you sure? She'd have said, yeah, why? And I would have said something like, well, I don't know. You seem a little off. She said, no, I'm fine. I'm just fine. Okay, then we'd have had lunch. She wouldn't have brought it up, right? Because she didn't know how. Uh, I'd have come back to my office. I'd have worked all afternoon. I'd have come down from dinner. By then, she's had a lot more time of thinking about how rude and inconsiderate I am. Uh, the devil's popping more ideas in her brain. And uh, by dinner time, she'd have been banging pots and pans and she'd have just had a real kind of irritated look on her face, to which point I would have said something like, are you sure you're okay? Because it sure doesn't feel like it. And then she'd have said something like, yeah, I'm fine, except, you know, you're a rude and inconsiderate slob, at which point th then the fight would have been on, right? Now, that didn't happen, but it could have. And we had similar situations like that over his 40-year marriage where things like that did happen. But by resolving it gently right away, when she was able to come in and say, I feel when you, and I like to ask you too, we got the thing resolved very quickly. Now, the other thing this points to, though, is the importance of emotional safety in a relationship, all right? 
Um, the when you go to your spouse and you say, I feel, you've now taken your heart out of your chest and you've set it out there and you've become vulnerable now. And if your spouse were to say something like, well, that's stupid, why would you feel like that? No one in their right mind would have been upset because I didn't, you know, look at you when you brought me some tea. You need to grow up. Well, man, that's going to cause some really deep emotional scars. So this has to happen in an environment of, of emotional safety. The reason the gentle startup works is because at the very core is the idea that I really love you and I don't want to hurt you. And if I do, I want to know about that so I can stop doing it. And if you can find a gentle way to tell me that I've screwed up and hurt you, I'm going to accept that. But if it comes out as criticism, whereas a husband now I'm feeling disrespected or I'm feeling uh, like a failure, I'm more likely to attack back or to get defensive or just shut down. And the same, same goes for, for the women, right? If, if I can communicate times when my wife has, has hurt me in a little way, in a way that still says, I love you. And in a way that still says, you're important to me. I'm not abandoning you or walking away. She's much more likely to listen to it too and say, okay, thanks. Um, and, but it's got to be in a safe environment where you, you pledge to each other that I'm not going to hurt you on purpose. I promise. And if I'm really angry, I'm going to call a timeout and I'm going to walk away and we'll come back together in an hour or two hours or whenever it makes sense. So safety is a really important uh, in part of, of these uh, of these relationships, okay, and of these conversations and how you resolve conflict. All right, a um, couple other couple other thoughts. Uh, you know, the only way to really solve marital problems is through compromise. And you know, I had a priest tell me early in in my marriage. He said, "Doug, listen, man, here's the deal." If it's not a sin, give in. Give in. I mean, a happy wife is better than a husband who's right all the time. You can be right, but lose the wife. What would you rather do? So I'd rather have the wife. Good. Then give in. You can't compromise in areas of morality, of course, in areas of sin. But other than that, you can compromise on everything. So compromise, right? Accepting influence from each other. Here's the deal. When men accept influence from their wives, uh, they have happy marriages. When husbands don't accept influence from their wives, they have an 81% chance of divorce. 81%. I mean, that's staggering when you get husbands who are, you know, little dictators and they don't include their wife, you know, and they, they, they're very domineering. Okay. So, um, Finding common ground. So one of the techniques that I talk to couples about when it comes to compromise is, uh, again, this is a Gottman idea, but it's called the circle in a circle exercise. You just take a piece of paper, draw a small circle in the middle and a bigger circle around the outside edge. In the center, you write those things that you absolutely cannot, will not compromise on, period. I cannot compromise on it. And the outside circle, all those things you can't compromise on. The odds are there's only going to be a couple of things in that inner circle that you can't compromise on. So you each kind of do that exercise separately and you come together. But now it really structures the conversation around the key points. And what I find so often when couples get into arguments or conflicts is it becomes a kitchen sink fight. And it starts out over something little, like you didn't look at me when you thanked me when I brought you the cup of tea. And all of a sudden it becomes about how forgetful I was on our 35th wedding anniversary and how I forgot a kid's birthday and how, and all these things that I've done over the last 40 years. And it becomes this huge thing. And I can't, you can't solve 57 problems at once, but I can solve one. And if we stay focused on the one thing, the fact that I need to look up for my computer screen when I thank my wife, I can solve that. Now, if we want to have a conversation about other things, we can do that too. But one problem at a time, get the one problem resolved before you bring in the kitchen sink kinds of things. Okay. 
Um, and the idea is we've got to, you know, accept our partner's flaws. Okay, we've got to just be tolerant of each other. That's just the deal. And I, you know, look at Christ as our example, right? I mean, the apostles had an awful lot of flaws. I mean, Peter had a ton of flaws. He still went on to be the head, the head guy, right? So, and you got to realize that the devil's primary point of attack is going to be to try to drive a wedge between the husband and the wife. If he could destroy the marriage, he's got a much better shot at destroying the children. And children have a right to grow up in a home with a mother and a father. And they have a right to grow up in a home where there's love. So it, it, it but so Satan is going to really, he really wants to destroy marriage. And he's having a pretty fair shot at doing it right now. And I, you know, I, I was reading that, um, uh, Sister Lucia, I think, you know, one of the seers, the Fatima seers, the, the, the one who lived into ripe old age, that in one of her audiences with uh, Pope John Paul II, she said somehow, I guess it was real to her, but that marriage was going to be the thing that Satan was going to attack in the last half of the 20th century and the first part of the 21st century. And obviously we see that going on in society right now. The divorce rate, same-sex marriage, there's so much confusion around marriage and what it is that you just got to know that, that we're fighting, not only are we fighting our own defects, we're fighting, you know, some diabolic, you know, crosshairs that are trying to pull us apart, okay? Uh, and I just, I just want to end on one last thought, and then we'll take some questions. And I, I want to read a little bit here from St. Matthew's Gospel on the question of divorce, because I think it's very, very insightful. And there came to him some Pharisees, testing him, saying, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for any cause? But he answered and said to them, Have you not read that the Creator from the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Therefore now they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give a written notice of dismissal and put her away? He said to them, because Moses, by reason of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to put away your wives. But it was not so from the beginning. And I say to you, whoever puts his wife away except for morality and marries another commits adultery. And who, he who marries a woman who has been put away commits adultery. The longer I do this work, there's three words in the middle of this passage that are overwhelmingly powerful. And I've witnessed it now a lot. And he says, because Moses, by reason of the hardness of your heart. And in every couple that I've worked with that hasn't made it, that's gone on to divorce, one, at least one, has a hardened heart. And once that heart becomes hardened, it's almost impossible to soften it back up. It takes a lot of prayer. It takes sometimes a minor miracle to soften it up. So the, the thing I would say is, if you feel your heart getting hardened, if you feel yourself becoming emotionally distant, you need to get help right away to save the marriage. Marriage is... Every marriage, I believe, can be saved if caught early enough. Marriage disharmony is a lot like cancer. Early detection is the key to recovery, to healing, to cure. But the longer you let it go, the harder it is to fix it. And the statistics, again, the statistics are from the time a couple realizes they're in trouble to where they actually get help is about six years. And that is almost always too late. There's wonderful science out there. The research is very clear on, on the difference between successful marriages and marriages that fail. And I tell people, it's not, it's simple. That doesn't make it easy, but it's simple to be happily married. It's not, you don't need a PhD, it's not complicated. There's just a few core things couples need to do well to really grow and nurture their marriage. So get help early if you're starting to feel this, this hardening of heart, all right? All right, 
Well, that, that wraps up my comments. We still, oh, right on time, 8.15, that's very good. Uh, and I'm happy to take uh, Q&A here. So let's see, I see one, let's see if I can read this. How do you create a safe environment? So that's, you know what, that's a really good question. And it, 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 it really, to me, so much of marriage boils down to the commitment that I'm going to do it right, whatever it takes. And the, the two pillars that make for a good marriage, a solid marriage is commitment and trust. Okay, and commitment means when I exchange vows, when I said till death do us part, when I promised God that I would stay married to you till I died, I meant it. And I'm also not willing to go through life unhappy. So I'm stuck with you. We're stuck with each other, but neither of us want to be unhappy. So let's fix it. Let's figure out what we need to do to be happy together. Okay. And the trust part is, it's not just, you're not going to have an affair. Trust is, I'm safe with you. When I'm with you, I'm in a safe place. And when you come over the end of the day and you fall into this, into these arms, you are now in the safest place on the face of the planet. Nothing can hurt you when you're inside my, my hug, okay? And it's a commitment you make that I'm gonna be safe for you. And if you're safe for me and I'm safe for you, we're gonna work out whatever problems we have. So I think it just starts with that commitment that I'm gonna be safe. And even if I'm hurt now, I'm gonna explain it to you in a way that's not gonna hurt you. That's not gonna be criticism, contempt, all our defensiveness. I'm going to be gentle in how I do that. I'm going to say, listen, I was hurt by the way you thanked me for that cup of tea, and I'd like to ask you to look at me. I can do that. But if it had gone the other way, and, you know, she'd have been percolating on it all day long, and by night, and she's yelling at me, and well, I'd have gotten defensive, and I'd have shut down. I'd have walked away. I did a lot of that in the early days of our marriage of trying to figure stuff out. So when I brought that gentle start up home idea, and that general startup idea home to my wife, probably about three years ago. She said, do you realize how many fights we wouldn't have had over the last 30 some years if we'd have known how to do that? I'm like, yeah, a lot. So I, I recommend that people actually take that general startup, I feel when you like to ask you to please, and put it on your refrigerator. Make it part of the very core of how you, um, uh, of how you communicate to each other. I, I think it's that important. All right, there's a few more questions here. Okay, let's see here. Um, are there any books on marriage you recommend? Um, yes, I, th there are. Um, any book written by John Gottman uh, is excellent. Uh, and there's a book, I'm looking at my, my bookcase, uh, Hold Me Tight by Sue Johnson. Any book written by Sue Johnson or John Gottman I recommend 100%. The only thing I'll say is, if you're looking to get some help, you're looking for a marriage therapist, you want to find someone who is trained in the Gottman method or in emotionally focused therapy, preferably both, because they, they go together very well, both of which are empirically proven to work, uh, and they're based on science, not based on somebody's opinion, uh, and they're very good, all right? So the Gottman method or emotionally focused therapy. You can find websites for both uh, for both of those organizations and they've got to find a therapist button, you put in your zip code and there you go, okay. Um, okay, how, how do I detect if my heart is hardening? Um, it's when you're starting to grow emotionally distant. It's when you're starting to say, I don't care. You can feel that I, um, my love is dying. And I just did not, it's not worth the energy anymore to really fight about it. And I'm just, emotional distancing starts setting in. That's how you know your heart is hardening. Um, is the temptation of using the kitchen sink in conversations a leading indicator of hardness of heart? In other words, are they related maybe? Yeah, maybe. Um, I think hardness of heart though just comes from frustration of just not, not being able to resolve conflict. And I'm just, I'm just so tired of it. And I just, I'm starting not to like you much anymore because we fight all the time. Gentle startup technique, I think can overcome that. The kitchen sink though, I think also comes from this frustration that no matter how much I criticize you, you're not getting any better. Yeah, because it's not how it works, right? 
and you really can't change people unless they want to change. And so since I, since you don't want to hurt your spouse, if you know how you're doing it, you're going to want to change. As long as your heart isn't hardened, you're going to be like, yeah, I can do that. And if it's reciprocal, okay, if it's reciprocated, if we're both in it and we both want to build a really strong marriage, it, it's really very much possible. So kitchen sink, I think, just comes to this frustration that I, no matter how much I'm criticizing you, you know, you're not getting better. Um, what if you cannot decide how long a timeout you need before discussing the issues? Two or three days too long. Yeah, no, two or three days is not too long. In fact, you know, if you don't know, it's okay to say, I don't know how much time I'm going to need to calm down, but I promise I will come back to you when I do and we will get this resolved. So I think that's the deal. Two or three days. No, it's not. What you need to be able to do is come back and discuss the conflict or the fight without getting emotionally revved back up. And maybe that takes two or three days and that's okay. So yes, two or three days is okay. You just got to get to a point where you're not going to get all angry about it. Again, you could talk about it rationally. And the way you do that is say, hey, listen, three days ago, you know, when you came home late, I was pretty hurt by that, you know? So you can talk, you can use the I startup in the past tense as well, okay? And you can talk about, you know, a year ago when this thing happened and this is how I felt, okay? You can heal some really old wounds that way as well. Uh, I just want to know if gentle startup is meant to change the other spouse's behavior or just express feelings. No, it is meant to change. It is meant to tell your spouse what he or she has done that's hurt you and then ask them to do something different. So you can't force your spouse to do that, right? So, so um, you know, in the case of a spouse who comes home late, say an hour late, you know, he could say, listen, it's just too much work for me to call home. I'm just not doing it. So you, you got to get over it. If I'm going to be more than an hour late, I'll call, but I'm just not going to do it. Well, okay, at least now you know, but hopefully the spouse would say, yeah, okay, I can, I can call. I, I got a phone, right? It's not like in the old days where there weren't cell phones. So it is meant to invite your spouse to treat you a little bit better and to not hurt you. And hopefully your spouse says, I love you. I don't want to hurt you. And I will do that for you. Uh, where can I find the emotion wheel? You know, if you Google the emotion wheel, you will come up with a thousand uh, templates that you can print out. There's a million of them out there, or a thousand of them. Uh, what about avoiding conflict over decisions where a mutually exclusive option must be made and that decision depends on differently ranked non-moral <laughs> priorities and values? Well, um, yeah. So there are times when you're both going to see it very differently uh, and both see it reasonably. Okay. Um, you know, uh, I don't know. You want to buy the Chevy and he wants to buy the Ford. Okay. Well, you just, there's no, you can't blend those two. It's one or the other. Right. And in those cases, someone's going to need to give in. Uh, and you're going to have to negotiate that as to which of us is going to win this one and which of us is going to lose. Okay. Um, uh, and generally what I'll say is it's usually the bigger person who gives in. So there you go, right? You want to be the bigger person, give in. Uh, and I don't mean to make light of, of that question because it's, it's a difficult one, but in some, you just, if you can't compromise, you're just going to have to, one person just going to have to give in. And there's this tendency to keep score that says, well, okay, last time I gave in, this time you got to give in. Scorekeeping always is detrimental to a marriage. And it's, you know, we do it, we do it uh, all the time, but it's really, uh, it's tough. So you don't want to, you, you want to avoid scorekeeping as much as you can. Okay. Um, let's see here. As with most of these talks, books, advice, etc., how does all this work when a spouse has mental illness or one is unable to reason with the person who lived normally? This is not a topic you generally address. So that's a really good point. Um, if there's mental illness, uh, generally I can't work with the couple, right? So if you've got, you, you've got to get healed, uh, yourself before we can work on the marriage. So if you've got a problem with depression or high anxiety or 
narcissism or a personality disorder or some emotional disorder, obsessive compulsiveness that's really paralyzing, you've got to get that mental illness. You've got to get yourself back to a place of, of mental health um, before you can actually work on the marriage. Now, what I will say is people with mental illness have a much better cure rate if their spouse is there helping them and supporting them. So a lot of times the tendency is to say, well, you go off and get fixed. And then once you get your act together, then I'll go to the therapy with you. Okay, you need individual therapy, great. But what can I do to help you? And I'll be glad to come to one of your sessions and meet your therapist and get that person's input as to how I can be here to support you and to help you. Uh, and then the, 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 the uh, cure rate is much higher in those instances. Okay. Um, is prayer helpful? Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, yeah. There's no substitute for prayer, especially, you know, the family prays together, stays together. Couples that pray together stay together, too. Right. And uh, it's interesting. There have been times in the past, I can speak a personal example, where my wife and I perhaps got in an argument or conflict about something. And we'll say, you know what? I, this is probably something we need to pray about. And we'll go over to church and sit in church for a half hour and pray about it or uh, in front of the Blessed Sacrament. And come on, we've got a very different perspective. And it's pretty hard to be angry when you're sitting in church. And at some point, you kind of just like, okay, Lord, I got it. I need to kind of grow up on this one. So prayer, um, yeah, no substitute for prayer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what do you recommend when you tell your spouse when you are hurt and he or she fails to acknowledge your pain? Um, that's tough, and, but I see it a lot. Um, and this is where, you know, you get to unite your suffering with that of Christ. Uh, and listen, there's a lot of suffering in marriage. Um, you can offer the suffering, you know, for your spouse's uh, sanctification. And that the spouse, you know, like St. Monica, right, who suffered so much at the hands of her husband and at the hands of her son, for that matter, because he was not a very good guy for a long time. Uh, but somehow her suffering paid, you know, and it, it her husband converted and uh, her son went on to be one of the greatest saints of all time. So the greatest theologians anyway. Um, and so if your spouse isn't going to kind of cooperate, that's a tough, that's a tough deal. Pray, sacrifice, etc. And, you know, and then get some individual help yourself. So I, I will actually see um, individuals. I mean, I, 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 I only deal with marital problems but I will see individuals if the spouse won't come because think back to the infinity loop. If you change any one of those four things, you change the system. So if I'm just working on your half of the, of the loop, but if we can change your behavior or your emotion, the system changes. And over time, you can actually improve a marriage, even if your spouse doesn't want to, it's very, it's possible. I've seen it happen. Okay. Uh, how do you, how do we encourage our spouse to attend these types of sessions? Uh, they think they don't need these talks. Yeah. You know, the, the hardest thing, one of the most frustrating things in my profession is when somebody says, I don't have any problems. I don't need to work on it. And I, and I've got a few cases like this right now. Uh, three, as a matter of fact, in all three, it's the husband who has got some pretty serious issues going on refuses to admit it and won't come in. And so the wife comes in and, and we're trying to work on it, but um, there's not much you can do except pray for a miracle. And I've seen miracles, I, I really have. So it is possible, okay. Um, let's see, how do you deal with a husband that resists growth, ignores and validates feelings of wife? Again, I, you know, pray, pray, because hopefully something will happen. You know, and I think if you use general startup, Perhaps sometimes that softens them a little bit. Um, if they if they feel safe that when you talk to them, you're not going to be disrespectful or suggest they're a failure as a husband, that can help them because husbands fear failure more than anything. And when they walk in my office, most of the time they're like, "Yeah, you're going to tell me I'm screwing up and something's wrong with me," and I don't. That's a very uncomfortable feeling. But women are much more comfortable dealing with their feelings. Men are not. So um, don't be disrespectful and don't trigger any, 
any feelings in him that he's somehow a failure. All right. Uh, let's see here. I think that's about all the questions right now. So let me go back and share it. Wait, I want to oh, I need to share my screen one last time. Um, so this is this is my contact information. My email is Doug at happymarriageforlife.com and my website is www.happymarriageforlife.com. Now, um, with that said, uh, each state licenses marriage therapists. And uh, so I'm licensed in the state of Illinois, which means I can talk to, I can do teletherapy with anybody in Illinois, but not with anybody outside of Illinois. So if you're outside of Illinois, I, I could talk to you, but we can't actually get into a therapeutic uh, relationship. Um, but again, outside of Illinois, I would, you can do a Google search, anybody that's Gottman trained or mostly focused therapy trained uh, will be very, can, can be very helpful and, and do that. Uh, the other thing I do is I do these workshops and I'm going to, uh, I've got a test run coming up in a couple of weeks and I'm going to start trying to do these day long workshops for married couples and for pre-married couples uh, and do it virtually just like we're doing here. And so I've invested in some cameras and lights and stuff so I could start doing some of these workshops uh, to, to reach a lot more people. And so as soon as I get those set up and scheduled, you'll find uh, information on the website on how to sign up for that. Um, and they make great gift ideas too. So uh, hopefully I can get that um, first of the year and really kind of hit the ground running offering some virtual workshops. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Doug. Um, it was a great presentation. I had heard you before and um, I, I thought it was very practical, you know, and you recommend some simple things that we can all put into practice and and um, I hope that there were some, you know, uh, young couples also that they don't have to wait 30 years to uh, improve their marriage. But I mean, if you are in those in that situation and married for so long, I mean, there, there's always there's always a, a chance to, you know, improve your marriage. So thank you very much, and um, we'll keep you posted. And I, I I will share your information also on our website. Very and good. for all of those that uh, are participant uh, participating in this. In this webinar, thank you so much. Uh, if you want to share the, um, the recording, I will send a, a, a link with that. It's being uh, posted on our Texas Family Enrichment Facebook page, so you can actually access, access it through there too. So, um, with any further ado, I say bye bye to all and bye, Doug, and thank you so much. Goodbye, everybody. Good luck. There. Be happy. Okay. Bye. Bye bye.